Yeah, we can see the audience growing. Awesome. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you all. We're just going to wait for a minute for you know people to just keep joining in, and then we can get started. Okay, I'm back. Yeah. So awesome. I think we should just uh, kickstart things and people are just going to keep joining in. Uh, so yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, it's uh, it's very great to see you again to our weekly we you know webinar series that we've been hosting for quite some time. And today we have someone very special with us. Uh, his name is Colin Patrick Fitzpatrick, and uh, he's from Animal Concerts. He's the founder and CEO of Animal Concerts. Uh, so yeah, welcome, uh, Colin. I think it'd be great if you could, you know, give us an introduction about yourself and, you know, what made you get involved with Web3. Sure, absolutely, Nick. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the invite. Really uh, happy to be here. So yeah, my name is Colin Fitzpatrick. I'm uh, one of the founders and the CEO of Animal Concerts. Uh, I'm Irish. I'm from Dublin in Ireland. Been living in Dubai for the last four years, currently living in Brazil for a little while. And uh, yeah, my background is in technology. I've been 20 years in tech companies like Oracle, Salesforce, Dell, HubSpot, uh, mainly in roles around sales, marketing, operations. Uh, got into crypto in kind of 2016. I think I've been following Bitcoin a bit since 2013. Unfortunately, I didn't buy any back then, but I did get in in 2016. And I, I suppose as soon as I properly understood the blockchain and Bitcoin and how it's going to disrupt finance, I was completely addicted uh, living in Ireland at that time, there really wasn't very much going on in the crypto scene. It's a very small place, uh, but I always really, really wanted to work in the space and I didn't quite know how. And then I moved to Dubai uh, with Oracle. And I suppose I've always been responsible for getting an awful lot of people into crypto. You know, it's like the religion. I, I, I was passionate about it. And I used to teach so many people uh, other about it that. I mean, even in Oracle, I used to say that at some stage there was more crypto trading being done in the Oracle sales floor than there was selling software. And one of the many, many people that I got into crypto, we used to just keep in contact. We both left Ireland and we traveled the world, but we used to keep in contact and talk about the markets. And we essentially just started spitballing ideas. Um, COVID had just kicked in. Everything was moving online. You know, uh, obviously there was no in, in real life concerts. So people were doing concerts online. And uh, the main one was, uh, I don't know whether you guys have ever heard of it, but there's a huge rave in Belgium called Tomorrowland. It's a massive, massive rave, 100,000 people plus, and all the big DJs go there. And they move their, they move their, uh, their, their big party online and they sold tickets, but they sold over a million tickets. And people just had parties at home in their house, you know, and one of, one of, one of my founders basically went to a party in someone's house where they set up some speakers and a, a screen in the back garden and they had a little rave in their back garden and he thought this was amazing and we thought you know maybe this is going to be the future maybe people are going to have more and more experiences online uh COVID just accelerated that um but we also really loved NFTs and more so of just very expensive monkey JPEGs but the actual utility behind NFTs and really how they are going to transform the music industry or any industry where you know uh, digital assets are uh, you probably just saw that the state of california is moving their dmv a license registration of, of uh, onto nfts and that's just the beginning and you know we really saw that uh, and we could talk about that later but specifically around music um that's something that we can bring to everyone everywhere around the world we want to democratize concerts and it also in the metaverse and when i started talking about this in the metaverse nearly two years ago People thought I had two heads. They had no idea what the metaverse was. Thankfully, then a few months later, Mark Zuckerberg came out and really solidified the fact that the metaverse is the future of the internet, which made our conversations an awful lot easier. But ultimately, um, we have the ability to bring A-list artists into this world of Web3 because they are, everyone in the music industry is bombarded by everything Web3, NFT, mm -hmm. metaverse. But in my experience, these are musicians, these are artists. 
they're not technologists and they don't truly really understand it. I mean, a lot of technology people don't actually understand it. So they need someone like us to really handhold them and bring them from the start to the finish and uh, create this entire experience for them and their audience while remaining congruent with their brand and their likeness and what they're what they want portrayed. And that's what we do. And we've been lucky enough to be able to work with some of the biggest stars in the industry. Started off with Alicia Keys. Uh, then we got a partnership with Snoop Dogg and Billy Ray Cyrus. Uh, Snoop Dogg just literally tweeted about our business, giving our support just the other day, which was a very big moment for us. Uh, mm -hmm. And then Robin Thicke as well uh, from the famous song Blurred Lines. We're introducing him. He's he's super open. He just wants exposure to the community. And uh, I can't tell you now, but we will be announcing in the next week or so uh, mm -hmm. a Metaverse concert with him pretty soon that we're very, very, very excited about. So, yeah, so, I mean, ultimately, um, I've gone through this incredible journey uh, going from the normal tech world uh, into the Web3 world, which has been the the, the greatest opportunity of my career. Um, super exciting and incredible amount of very, very hard work. But uh, it's amazing to work in this industry. Uh, everyone is super friendly. It's all about partnerships and not competition. You know, a rising tide lifts all boats and we're all winning together. And uh, I'm I'm very, very optimistic for the future of the space. Awesome. I mean, uh, it's such a pleasure to have you with us and, you know, to, just to learn about your story has been very inspiring as well. And the fact that, you know, you've been into this space for almost, what, eight years or so has been uh, has been nothing short of, you know, exemplary. And the fact that you've, you know, entered the space early, learning each and every bit of the, the you know, the, the core essence of the technology is something that really matters in this space. And a lot of people don't understand that. And I'm Happy about the fact that you know you've you've uh, been able to you know part, get an audience as well as partner up with some of the biggest names in in the music industry. So yeah, um, I want to understand and dive a little deeper now and understand you know what do you think does the future of live music music events look like in the metaverse and what would be the role of AI in enhancing these concert experiences that you've just told us about? Sure. I suppose it's first of all important to say that we're not trying to replace concerts. It's always going to be amazing and for most people better to be in a real concert, that loud music, the pounding of the bass, the excitement and the atmosphere. But that doesn't mean that we can't create equally fantastic experiences, you know, from the comfort of your own home. I mean, not everyone has the opportunity or the ability to go to a concert. I mean, what I always say is, you know, uh, especially from, uh, you know, far eastern, uh, far, far away places, Southeast Asia, etc. You could be the biggest Beyonce fan in the world. But, you know, if you're living in Bangladesh, she's probably not going to come and you don't have most likely the resources to go somewhere else. So we want to bring the ability to have a really exciting, immersive and interactive experience in the metaverse where everyone around the world can join. But they can do it in a way whereby they can still join it with their friends, just like everyone does with gaming right now. Now, I'll hands in the air. I'm not a gamer. I haven't been a gamer since I was in my late teens. But I do have a fair bit of exposure and I know how the industry works and I know how they think. And What's important to note here is that the gaming industry is really at the forefront of the technological push and this sort of shift in what's happening. Yeah. Um, be it, you know, what's going on with Twitch and streaming or, you know, the, the technology push from, from the development frameworks that we build on, like, like Unity and Unreal and things like that. That's really pushing everything in the metaverse. And at the end of the day, what are the biggest metaverses right now? It's Fortnite and Roblox and things like that. I mean... I don't know. Personally, I don't really consider them proper metaverses. I think it should be more of a blockchain world, but they, they are games. But there's there's still a online world where people go in and they have experiences and they play games and they have fun and they interact with things and they do it in a social manner because that's really what the next, you know, what the metaverse is. It's a social platform. That's what Roblox is. It's a social mm -hmm. platform. And what I, I think, I mean, I'm 42. I, I think what a lot of people my age and older don't necessarily understand, especially if they don't work in technology, is that kids today are, that's where they are interacting. That's where they are socializing. They are going into Fortnite. They're not even playing the game. They're hanging out in the lobby. They're running around. They got the headset on. They're playing with their friends. They're talking to their friends. They're, you know, and their digital identity Mm -hmm. is really what is most important to them. And I've been talking about this for about two years. And there was a light bulb moment for me 
uh, about two years ago when I called up one of my friends and told him what I was doing. And I said, do you know what the metaverse is? And he goes, uh, yeah, not really. I mean, I've heard of it. And I started explaining to him and he goes, okay. He goes, now I get it. Cause he goes, I have a 14 year old son. And I said to him the other day, well, let's go to the mall. We're going to buy you some Nikes. We're going to buy some new shoes. And the, the kid said, dad, can I have the money instead? Cause I want to spend it on my avatar. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, this is crazy. And, and, you know, that was two years ago for me. And a lot of people are still understanding this, that kids today have a very acute value for digital assets in the way that older people don't. And we are used to going, you know, I want to buy something. So I want, you know, this phone or I want this pair of headphones, but kids are spending hundreds of dollars a month on, you know, on things that don't exist in the, in the real life. And they are buying skins and they're buying T-shirts and sunglasses and shoes because their digital identity is becoming just as or even more important to them as their physical identity, because that's where they spend all their time. And that, to me, is what the future of the metaverse is. And I, th I still think we're so, 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 so early. Yeah. But the metaverse is not just something that people are playing about with that w might work or might not. Mm -hmm. The metaverse is just what the Internet is going to become into the future. And... Uh, I think it's really important to sort of set that out as to what that's coming on, because our lives are increasing more, increasingly more and more digital. We spend more time chatting with our friends on WhatsApp than we do in, 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 in real life. Mm -hmm. It's not like, uh, you know, 50 years ago when everyone hung out in the same village and they, would you know, go to the rec center or a bar and see each other there. Now we're just living online and that is going to continue to increase. Right now, you know, if you want to go into the metaverse in a 3D, you have to have an Oculus headset. And, you know, no one really wants to walk around all day with a brick on their face. Yeah. But what will happen, my prediction in the next three years, is you will have a pair of glasses exactly like the ones you are using now. It will beam a photorealistic, high quality image into your glasses. You're not even going to need a desktop computer monitor mm -hmm. anymore because... You will just see there, you'll stare into space. It'll be like a 60K TV in front of you and you'll have your mouse and keyboard or maybe it'll go gestures with your hands. And that is really what's coming. Now, when it comes to AI, well, I'm completely fascinated by ChatGPT, which I'm sure you and most other people have seen. And, are, and I, I, this is just completely revolutionary for me. Um, I think the world is going to change in the next two to three years more than we can possibly imagine. Uh, some unbelievable benefits, but obviously some pretty much some drawbacks around jobs as well. But I do think we will adapt. But the way it's going to happen to me in AI uh, in the metaverse is that it's going to be like your friend and your guide. So one of the things that I think is a problem in the metaverse right now, and I've been in a lot of metaverses, they're very clunky. You don't know what to do. You're having trouble getting around. And if you don't have a good experience yeah. at the beginning, yeah, that's it. I'm not coming back. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, the, the AI is going to make that experience a whole lot more fluid. So we're familiar with NPCs, non playable characters. AI will create these characters that will talk to you. Like we're talking to each other right now. You will have a conversation with them. And you will go, what is this? And they'll go, this is XYZ Metaverse. And, you know, we, and they go, what can I do? I went, I'm here. Let's go. Show me. Follow me. And it will be your guide. And if you have a problem or a question, you'll be able to talk to it. You won't have to go into the help section and, you know, troll a whole lot of articles. You'll have a conversation with someone and they'll, and they'll guide you through that. And they will link you up with people that have the same uh, interests or values as you. You will socialize an awful lot more. You will figure out what interaction and entertainment is there for you. You'll focus on the utility of this metaverse and you will overall be able to have far better time than you really can today because the amount of time that people spend in the metaverse right now is very, very small. Yeah. Even the amount of time that I spend in the metaverse is very, very small because for the most time it's an empty room unless there's something good going on there. Now what me and my team in Animal Concerts are trying to do is bridge the gap for a lot of first timers because if we can create a concert experience with a headline artist that they are you know really passionate about and really love and it will be different to a standard concert but it will be an immersive experience where you can feel like you're there and you're right mm -hmm. not even just 
by, you know, backstage or at the stage, but on the stage with this person. And what I think is really revolutionary is that with a, you know, an Oculus headset, you can feel like you're there. You really, really can. You put this thing on. You're not thinking I'm standing with a brick on my face. You're, you're, you're kind of going, I am literally there on stage dancing around with whoever it is. And I think that's absolutely game changing. So, um, I do think the technology is still reasonably early. They're making massive strides. I mean, there's at least 200 prominent metaverses being built at the moment. And there's probably hundreds of other ones we haven't even seen yet, but I've seen some amazing metaverses that are number one influence, infinitely scalable. Cause you look at decentralized and sandbox, they do have scalability issues. I mean, you can only put a certain amount of people in a parcel. Now you can have multiple mm -hmm. versions of that parcel, but at the end of the day, um, other ones are building photorealistic metaverses. I think these clunky avatars are going to be what we look back and laugh at, like the 1980s games. Yeah. People like Hyper Real are coming in with proper photorealistic ones. You're going to have technology that'll track your facial movements and stuff like that. And it will be a, you know, uh, an avatar 90% as good as what we're looking at each other right now. And when that uncanny valley is sort of passed, uh, everyone will then start spending an awful lot more time in what is essentially just the 3D internet. Awesome. I think you've covered a lot of ground here. And one thing that did stand out was when you, you, you know, mentioned that uh, the metaverse is not just a virtual world, but it also sort of, you know, going to be a VR and AR technology is also coming into play. And I feel there are going to be other, a lot of other technologies also, like for example, haptic gloves with this, this technology where it allows you to sense the environment around you or, you know, actually feel those things that you are, um, doing in those virtual experiences and this is something that even uh and what you mentioned about the glasses this is something that google has also been developing google lens i think i saw an ad where um the the person wears these glasses and he's able to you know uh, and two people from different um from diverse backgrounds were able to understand each other because it allows you to give uh subtitles directly right in front of you Absolutely. and so that was something you know truly revolutionary i thought that was such a, a game changer and it's going to solve so many problems and remove the barriers of communication that have existed for so long so yeah definitely i mean i can see and i wanted to understand uh the role of ar also like you've mentioned vr a lot here but i want to understand yes. you know how how ar is going to come into all of this well, I think AR is more important than VR. I mean, VR is one of these sort of trends that didn't quite take off as much as people thought it would. And there's a number of reasons behind that. Number one, brick on the face. You know, it's it's like, I just posted something on LinkedIn and you might've seen it the other day. And it was a guy who, and actually a friend of mine does this. He, he literally got rid of his desktop monitors. He has his headset on and it showed the video and he's looking around his room and there's a giant monitor here and there's another one there and he's got the Bitcoin price up there and he's got spreadsheet there. <laughs> Wonderful in theory, but not practical day to day because number one, again, it's uncomfortable to wear these giant, you know, yeah. half a kilo things on your face. Number two, the resolution just isn't good enough for a lot of practical applications. Okay. Uh, fine for maybe scrolling the web if the text is good, but you know, it's just not really good. However, Apple have come out and have said they believe the future is augmented and mixed reality, not virtual reality. And I absolutely agree with them. Now, I'm yeah. not an Apple fan. OK, I am talking to you from a MacBook, but I kind of hate it. But <laughs> I do have great appreciation for the fact that they do have a deep understanding of what people want and what they need from a user experience perspective. Mm -hmm. And they've been late to the game. I mean, everyone's brought out a headset, you know, you've got, you know, the Oculus and you've got the HTC and, you, you know, there's a bunch of them. And, and actually I was just watching a video yesterday from CES and a Chinese company came out with a very, very clunky pair of glasses. I mean, like yours, but the frames were about four times bigger, very, very clunky, but it literally projected an image in, in inside and you can see which is, which is where it's going. Apple are going to come out with their own AR, MR headset, but then they're going to come out with a set of glasses and they really, really will be very, very similar to what you're wearing now. And it will put a high quality image in your eyes. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, I've always said that I have a three-year-old son. He was, he was about to do a bit of a BBC news there and walk in on me, but um, I think he's going to look back in 10 years time and go, dad, 
So you experience the internet by holding this piece of glass and plastic in your phone and you were like hunched over like this and you're stroking it with your finger. And that will be wild to him, I think. I yeah. think we're all going to have a pair of glasses. We're we're going to be able to, you know, not be immersed in this, you know, phone, but it's going to be mixed reality. Yeah. Uh, hopefully I won't get given out to by my wife for staring at my phone so much. I can sort of, you know, view it inside my glasses. Maybe that will create even worse problems of people just yeah. not paying attention. But I also think you're going to walk into a cafe and there's going to be 10 people sitting in their own tables and they're just going to be sitting there and maybe they'll have a mice and keyboard or maybe they'll be doing minority report stuff like that. Or maybe they'll just be, you know, moving their fingers very gently. And that is the way it's going to have to go because we we, we need technology is already taken over our, our lives. Yeah, Technology will continue to become more and more central and overpowering. But if it's going to last, it's going to have to become how do I say this more conjoined in a natural manner and one that is, you know, more complementary to the way we want to live our lives and not, I mean, already every parent are like, I used to go out and play on the street all day with my friends. And now my kids are just suck, stuck to an iPad. And, you know, and that is the thing. I think we do need to get away from that. I think augmented and mixed reality will really help that happen. Absolutely. And I think uh, even in the music industry, AR is going to play a huge, huge part. And what I am seeing, like what I can predict from, you know, just from now is that we're going to see a massive convergence of different industries coming together, like from, you know, from gaming, uh, from music to film to sports and Web3, AI, AR, VR technologies all coming into this singular, you know, cohesive concept called the metaverse. And we're going to see brand collaborations, brand activation, and these immersive yeah. experiences like we've never seen before. And that is something that I'm truly, truly excited about. Yeah. And uh, I'm actually well, we're looking seeing forward to the developments in the next two to three years. Look, we're seeing this already. Um, and I'm reasonably close to this because brands are piling into the metaverse and i'm sure you've seen this that there's a list of about a hundred massive name brands and they're all piling in why are they doing this the reason to me is because if you're budweiser or you're nike or someone like that your advertising and marketing promotion dollars are spent on just getting your logo out there your brand out there let's Let's focus on concerts. If you're if you want to if, if you're going to advertise at a concert and you're Heineken or or someone like that, what does that consist of? It's a banner. It's yeah. a logo up on the on the thing. Maybe you'll have you know some beer cans. Maybe there will be a video, but that's kind of it. And they're going to yeah. encourage you to very you limited know, to buy that. If you're a non you know of you know a lot of people drink alcohol <laughs> at uh, at concerts, but if you're not something that can be consumed at a concert. You're really constrained into your logo being up there and your brand being there. But if you're in the metaverse, your brand can now be really engaged with the end user yeah. in a manner that they have not seen before. Yeah. So yeah. the main thing that we're trying to do is provide the most interactive and engaging experience between the end user and the brand possible. And that is something that's not looking at a fleeting logo for five seconds, if you're lucky. It's actually engaging the end user with this brand in a quest or a yeah. competition or some sort of fun activity. So let's say, for example, and I'm just making stuff up here. Mm -hmm. Nike wants to be part of a concert with Snoop Dogg. I can go, all right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to create... 20 pairs of super exclusive, glowing Nike shoes that allow you to fly. Yeah. And if you run around and collect, uh, you know, a whole load of Nike stars in different places, or you engage with other people and get them to join your team and get extra points, the people who collect these things will get these glowing Nikes and they'll be able to fly around the stadium and everyone will want that. Mm -hmm. And that is just absolute music to the ears of the Nike marketing and PR team, because you're getting the engagement of an end user for several minutes in a row. 
you are becoming the thing that everyone wants. And I mean, they're doing this already. And I give you an example. My my CTO, Jack, he has two teenage kids. And I, I actually can't remember the game they were playing. It was probably Fortnite, but there was a concert. And what you could do in this concert is you could get control of a gun and this gun would shoot, not bullets, but it would shoot ketchup. And you would shoot ketchup over the stage and at your friends. And this was the coolest thing that all of the kids wanted. And it was sponsored by Heinz or something like that. Okay. And this is the type of crazy thing, because what I've always said is that the metaverse is like creating the world that we all wish we could live in. Yeah. Because you can leave all the horrible stuff out there behind and you can, you know, be whoever you want to be. Okay. I'm short. Maybe I can be taller in the metaverse. Okay. Uh, I'd like to fly. I can do it in the metaverse. You want to teleport? You can do it in the metaverse. You want to look completely yeah. different. You want to, it's about your persona that you want to get out there. Now, I do truly hope that everyone will maintain a persona that is still reasonably the same as the person they are. Uh, we've all seen Ready Player One and everyone has this crazy character and it's, I, I, I don't want that as a future. I'm, some people will and some people won't. Um, but at the end of the day, you'll be able to do whatever you want to do. You'll be able to be whoever you want to be and you don't have the constraints of the real world. Yeah. For brands, yeah. I mean, the sky is the limit as to how creative they can be. But just the fact that they can actually maintain this prolonged engagement with the end user and really, and and, and then, you know, at the end of the day, uh, okay, we, we, we have a shopping mall full of products and you can browse and you can buy it, you know, you can be an NFT, but you can get the physical delivered to you as well. And, exactly. uh, and that's, know, that's something that I just wanted to add as well that, you know, uh, we've had these kind of experiences like we have we've had this platform called second life from a very long time right yes which does allow you to you know create your own avatar and be something that you're not in the uh, in the real life but what is different now is that there is a tangibility between the you know digital and the physical world where you can own things on in the digital realm and that is something that is yours to keep and that is something that becomes a part of you and it I think we're going to have layered experiences between digital and physical world. And it's got, these technology will sort of, sort of augment that entire experience. Yeah, I mean, I think the digital twin thing is 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 really taking, taking shape right now. And uh, like I saw a cool video the other day of an augmented reality app on your phone that lets you try on various pairs of shoes, Reebok or whatever it is. So you'll be able to go into the metaverse, you'll be able to shop for your, you know, digital assets, but you're really shopping for physical assets. Now, at the end of the day, where are the areas that the metaverse is going to be most prominent? Uh, clearly gaming, obviously, then, you know, interactivity via concerts and events and, and things like that. Uh, after that, it may be shopping. I mean, you know, people used to say 20 years ago, oh, I'd never buy clothes online. You need to try them on. Well, you know, we all do it. Okay, maybe not everything and maybe not everyone, but a lot of people do. So that has changed. Uh, maybe it will be things that furniture, et cetera. You'll have a metaverse version of your own house and you can beam different furniture in. I know that, you know, Ikea and a few other people are working on this sort of stuff already. You'll walk around your house, you'll scan yeah. it, it'll create a metaverse version and you can try out what, what goes on there. But imagine being able to take a wander around uh you know snoop dogg's mansion in sandbox and you can see some of the cool things he has and then you can click and buy it and get it delivered to your house that's happening you know that's already happening uh so there's, there's, there's a wonderful opportunity for this more immersive and 3d experience of yeah. shopping and then it'll go into education i mean i'm in a very remote place in brazil right now and I was walking out of a restaurant and there was a construction site ahead of me and there was a barcode on it. And I don't speak much Portuguese, so I didn't know what it said, but I scanned the barcode. And what was it? Only a full on metaverse concept of this housing development that they're building in apartments. And it was it was amazing. It wasn't quite photo real, but it was good enough. And you can go, I want to go to the pool and I want to go to the bedroom and it zoomed you around. And this is in a little place and a little, you know, development, nothing too fancy. So, you know, 
property sales. I, I, I know some people that are doing some really cool stuff right now yeah. around creating a metaverse where they can go to all these big property companies and go, we'll build you the metaverse version of this high-end development for free. So your clients can really not just look at a brochure on your phone, but get a 3D immersive experience. And then we'll take a cut of what it is. And, and there, there's another thing. And then it comes down to education is the next one. You know, that's that's the next big mover for how people are going to be uh, trained and educated uh, online in a, in, a, in a more immersive experience. Absolutely. And I'd just like to add a few points here. So you mentioned something about digital identity as well. So I think because we have uh, wallet logins, there's a greater sense of anonymity also, which is involved, which allows even uh, some of the, the marginalized communities to have a voice. And they, like you said, they, they are able to uh, express the, the different aspects of their identity without the constraints of any of their physical experience or the social status. So I think that is going to be a, a big boost to how, you know, these different communities from LGBTQ communities can express themselves. Secondly, um, with respect to the, the, the topic that you just picked up, with, you know, that real estate and, for example, if I am, uh, it, these technologies allow me to immerse myself and view myself within that property, uh, you know, premises. And that is something that I see that... Uh, one of the biggest biggest use cases that I see here is that even let's say if I'm moving to another country, be, even before before I move in, I can actually just sitting here in India, I can view yeah. property in UK and actually get a sense of you know what it's going to be like. So that is also an added you know uh, layer to what you've just said. And thirdly, uh, with respect to education, I think what we're going to see in the future is that with the emergence of AR VR technology and gamified experiences. We're going to see a very personalized uh, course or a you know course schedule, uh, which is adapted to your learning style. Like for example, every child is different. Yeah. Right? Every person absorbs information in a in a different way. One does it through sound. One does it through reading. Or one does it through actual pra practical experience. So Absolutely. these, with the emergence of metaverse and AI together, I think these gonna uh, it's gonna create a very personalized experience for each individual to learn by their own learning. You know by their own learning style a hundred percent and i have a friend of mine who's been in the education space and recruitment space for a long time she's working with the saudi government who you know they're creating this new city called neom yeah and they need to hire Isn't the one and, with the line the entire line yeah the, oh yeah okay. yeah the line is part of it exactly yeah and it's really, really cool. I'll talk about that in a minute. But they need to hire and then skill up and educate like half a million people. And you can't do that very easily unless you're using automation. And that's what AI will, will do. Yeah. And that's what her platform is going to do. Because there was a really cool thing. And I, a couple of my friends have started working there now. And I'm really interested in it because with the line, you know, they haven't even fully thought about exactly how you're going to build that. Because what they're going to do is build an AI to build it. And it will be, you know, uh, something that will be <clears throat> uh, evolving over time. But exactly as you say, they need to get people educated properly, not from these crappy online courses that you have to click through and listen to yeah. these videos that are really boring, but it will be uh, transformative and it will change according to exactly as you said, your learning style. And I think that will be amazing. Yeah, so um, you know we've you've covered the metaverse, we've covered a little bit of AI as well. Now I'll just shift your focus towards Web three side of things as well, where but you know where I want to uh, dive a little deeper into the non fungible token side of things, and uh, and first let's talk about blockchain for a second here. How do you see blockchain being uh, used in the meta, you know, music industry to benefit benefit artists and fans? Sure. Well, I personally think that. NFTs have some of the greatest utility and ability to really change things and fix problems in the music industry than any other, you know, um, I, uh, like I've had uh, countless conversations with artists and record labels and things like that. And if you think about it, the music industry has already had many, many large shakeups starting with Napster when it absolutely yeah. rocked the entire industry then you got YouTube and all this stuff going on there for free and then you got you know Spotify and all the other streaming services 
Mm. And then you got TikTok, which is just completely taken over now. And TikTok stars are taking off. And, you know, this I, I, we had um, I was on a panel with a guy called Scott Page, who was a band member of Pink Floyd. And he was also in Toto at Supertramp. So this guy's a 40 year veteran of the music industry and he's an absolute legend, but he's also deep into NFTs. So I said to him, will you come on a Twitter spaces? And we did a Twitter spaces because he he has this incredible passion about how NFTs are like digital freedom and identity. Yeah. And it's like storytelling. And he told these amazing stories of young a young girl that he knows who you know created her art into NFTs and then started selling it. She wasn't making millions, but she was making mm -hmm. decent money. But she took the residual 10% of it and she gave it to her little <clears throat> local youth center. And that was enough money to keep them ticking over and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, creating some sort of good in the world, which was really, really cool. But he also talks about how his friends in the music industry going back decades are calling him up going, Scott, how do I make any money? I can't make any money anymore. You know, like it, TikTok's taking all the all the things. Yeah. Spotify's taking all of it. Unless you're Taylor Swift, you're not making any money. You need to get millions of views yeah. to make any money out of this. And that's got to change. What we're doing is we're creating a video on demand platform for imagine TikTok meets Netflix. So it's created content. Um, but it's where actually the users can can get animal tokens back uh, by engaging in watch to sorry um, in in watch to earn. So you're familiar with play to earn from games. This is watch to earn. That's what we're creating. But okay. what NFTs do, like okay, Snoop Dogg, who we're working with, um, he was on a podcast a little while ago, and he proclaimed that he's taking his music off uh, Apple Music and Spotify. This is from a. a, a I can't remember, sorry, I'm mind blank, but he bought a record company the other day, Death Row Records, that's it. Yeah. And he's taking all the Death Row Records music off uh, Apple Music at Spotify. And people said, why? What if people want to listen to your music? And he goes, well, well, what about me? I made that music. Am I not entitled to make money off that music? If people want to enjoy it, do I? should I not be entitled to get something out of that? So he's creating his music as NFTs. Because he goes, if you want to own my music, does listening to one on Spotify mean you own my music? No, it does not. Does mm -hmm. owning a CD and listening to the music, is it really? No, it doesn't. But if you own that NFT, you literally own that music. And then you can swap it and trade it and make money with it and engage with it and you know rent out NFTs, which people are doing an awful lot of these days. And that's kind of you know a real game changer as well. I've met bands that have gone, we're not, going to go with a record company because I think record companies are a dying industry yeah. slowly not, they're not going to die tomorrow or anything like that but slowly there yeah. these things are changing because why should a record company get to own and make decisions about all of wh what happens with someone's music so you may have heard that Taylor Swift was recently in a situation where she her music catalog from a record company came up for sale and she went okay i'm gonna buy that i have the money and they went no and they sold it to scooter braun and then he flipped yeah. it and made 200 million dollars how is that how is that real how is that allowed how is that what's happening that's ridiculous so what these new up-and-coming indie bands etc are going right we're going to create our album as an nft we're going to push it out there and give the opportunity for our closest, I don't know, thousand, cup, 10,000 fans to buy a portion of that. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is if we explode and become the next Maroon 5, your NFT that you yeah. invested in us and that you showed your, how do I say, your confidence in us and that you, you believed in us, that's going to make money for you. And mm -hmm. it'll make residual money because you know you 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 can get the ten percent back to and and that is amazing. That is so cool because imagine you had discovered Michael Jackson in the early days yeah. and you had or Nirvana. Never mind, you know, Rage Against the Machine, something like that. If you bought the NFT of Nirvana, never mind, mm -hmm. when it was out, when no one knew who the hell they were, and then it exploded in one of the greatest albums of all time. Isn't that amazing? Then the the artist yeah. retains control. The fans can actually be engaged. And at the end of the day, and this Scott Page was saying this on the spaces, you make your most money out of your thousand yeah. most passionate fans. If you can get a thousand passionate fans, you can make money. 
if you can multiply that into 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 or whatever, you know, and you saw also, I mean, I'm engaged in another project right now, Ticketmaster, another shower of, I won't say what's, they are scourging the market. And, you know, some of Taylor yeah. Swift's most crazy, crazy fans couldn't get a ticket because they were selling for thousands of dollars. That's what the blockchain is going to do. It's going to it's going to bring back the control to the yeah. people and take out these horrible actors. Uh, sorry, I don't mean actors. I mean, horrible intermediaries and middlemen who are shafting everyone. Mm -hmm. And it's just not fair. And I think that is where the blockchain is going to provide the most value. Yeah, some really, really nice points here. And I personally think it's not just music, but the entire creator economy will be rev revolutionized using these digital collectibles. And how I see NFTs is personally, I see it as community building tools that allow creators to onboard your, you know, the the super fans into your into a, an artist tribe, sort of pays it, paving new pathways for co-creation and ownership. And also reimagining the the artist fan relationships and the way we consume and experience uh, music and uh, any other form of art or content, right? And personally, I've been a part of Swaraj, that's um, Explorers Club, which is uh, at the frontiers of you know art, technology, music, and community. And I have been uh, I was I've been part of that project since eight months, and we've built from the ground up. You know, engaging in unscalable activities, engaging in those one-on-one -on -one conversations with the artists, helping them understand the entire concept of the space and what it means uh, to have ownership of your own uh, you know craft. And then slowly building it slowly in a way where you're engaging your fans in a more meaningful way. And you're also uh, at the same time empowering these, your own creators who believe in your vision to co-create with you at their own level. So that both of you, so, so let's say if an artist, uh, let's say if a fan purchases an NFT by an artist that they really admire. And at the same time, these artists believe in that artist. I mean, this 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 fan believes in their artist vision so much that he helps him co-create value, and then uh, put it out in the world, thereby increasing the entire uh, value of the NFT itself. And then, um, you know, sort of going into this cycle of uh, sort of creating you know massive value for the entire community as well. So I think these are the things that are gonna. Uh, change the way we interact with fans and and the artists in in the future. Yeah, very well said. And uh, I mean, look, everyone is sick and tired of concentrated value, and we really want distributed value now. And that's really what the the what the blockchain will do as well. Um, the creator economy is only going to get stronger. And mm -hmm. when you see stats like the fact that PewDiePie, a guy who plays video games and makes strange noises and used to curse and stuff like that is now quite literally the most syndicated person in the history of the world yeah. that shows you what's going on um we talked about tiktok <laughs> earlier and you know now what has happened is a lot of the record companies have just taken their sort of uh, the, the people who used to be out there going to the bands and listening to who's going to be the next big thing and then just sort of signing them and trying to make a big they've all just gone nah, right we're going over here we're just going to see who goes go big on tiktok and give them a record deal but you know what's really bad about that is you could be in your bedroom singing songs making funny dances and videos and a couple of them take off and get several million hits and along comes sony music or one of these um record companies and they go we're going to give you we believe in you you're going to be amazing we're going to give you a million dollars we're going to give you a million dollars, record company, record contract. We're going to make fame. Let's go. Do you know what that million dollars is? That is a million dollars of debt because that million dollars is quite literally an advance based on the money you will be making them into the future. Yeah. And if you want to make the, if they, if you, if you're getting a million dollars now, you're probably going to have to make them 5 million or more to do that. So mm -hmm. you've just got a massive debt laden around your neck. And you can't do anything without their permission. They have full control over everything. And that is just digital slavery. And that is what people want to get away from. So, you know, I, I, I'm sure there's an awful lot of people working on blockchain-based distributed music platforms where people can have their own control and use this platform to, to skyrocket their careers 
and maintain the vast majority of the profits and control as well? Uh, rightly said, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, even I can, can't say it any better. I mean, you've pretty much covered everything that uh, the potential of NFTs uh, that we can see. Um, so I want to move on to uh, the, you know, the next question that I had in mind, which is how is uh, AI changing the way music is created, performed, and consumed? Let's talk about the technology itself in yeah. terms of the production process. So, so this one is fascinating, and this one is something that's sort of come out of nowhere in a very short space of time. I'm engaged with a project that we're incubating right now. I can't tell you too much about it, but mm -hmm. it is a digital metaverse DJ character who will be simultaneously live on stage and in the metaverse. But what we're actually doing is building an AI to create the music itself. Now, the guy behind this is very, very well established DJ himself. But I was like, well, what if we get an AI to try and make music? Because you've seen what ChatGPT is doing. You've seen what Dolly 2 is doing about, you know, you create a, you, you type in, I want to see a monkey riding a spaceship juggling chainsaws, and it will create that image yeah. for you. Well, now you can do that with music. And when I say you can do it, they have Google. And if you Google this, you they've just built a model where you can go, I want a down tempo, chill out reggae tron with bongos with an African lady singing about the moonlight and it will create you that song, which is absolutely mind bending to me. Yeah. They have also done this on a very, very tiny selection of a couple of hundred thousand songs, which isn't enough. You know, give it Spotify and imagine what it'll do. Because what people don't realize is machine learning has just got so good now that it's as good as emulating a good human at a lot of things. And if you know uh, Tencent, the big Chinese company, yeah. they already have an AI engine, but they have a very, very strange way of doing it where it's spitting out thousands of songs and they're releasing all of them. And then a couple of them might be hits. But, you know, I, I, I study a bit of futurism and they've always talked about the fact that, you know, in the next five years or 10 years, you'll be getting the be best selling book written by AI and a best selling number, sorry, a number one hit song coming by AI. That's coming. That is absolutely yeah. coming. Google have said they're not releasing this technology. They got a white paper on it, but they're not releasing it because the music industry would be turned upside down. Yeah. And we've got I think it's really going to destroy the entire creativity around this uh, in, in this industry. And I think uh, we can leverage it. We can limit the, the the capabilities of AI in ways where you know we allow uh, the AI to just act as tools. For example, like if we have a synthesized if you want to use a synthesizer, but we don't have the actual, you know, software or the the actual hardware, we can just tell AI to, you know, create a, you know, a sound wave, uh, for example, as you use a saw yeah. wave where combine it with these three oscillators, route it here, and then you can have a sound. So something on these lines, I think, would be beneficial for the music industry. Well, the way I look at it, whether it's writing with ChatGPT creating images with Dolly 2 or maybe even music like this. Mm -hmm. The way I think it's going to go is it's very, very easy to flood the market with AI created content. But right now it definitely lacks the human, yeah. you know, authenticity and polish. So I think the way it's going to go is if you want something written and you just want it done quickly and it doesn't have to be of high quality, you'll get an AI to do it. Yeah. If you're willing to pay a premium for the human factor, you will pay that money to get the best quality. And we already have an example of that. It's a different example, but it's diamonds. Mm -hmm. People have been buying diamonds for, you know, hundreds of years and they're very, very expensive. They also take literally millions of years to create. And they're often dug out of the ground with, you know, child labor. And mm. now we have the ability to grow artificial diamonds, which are literally identical. Uh, one of those diamond testers or an expert cannot tell the difference. It, they're grown in a couple of months. It's completely ethical. No child or slave labor. And they're half the cost. But people still pay double the money for the real thing, even though no yeah. one can tell because they want to know that it's the real thing. 
they want to know that it's yeah. the not the human factor, but it's not artificial. And that is the biggest marketing campaign that you know ever existed. Diamonds, which and... diamonds, the De Beer. Yeah. Look into it. It's all a it's all a bit of a scam. Uh, they're yeah. artificially scarce. You know. There are diamonds for your finger uh, and there are diamonds for industry and the, the industrial diamonds are the same, but they just cost a whole lot less. Um, yeah, we could talk about that for ages. But, you know, when it comes to AI, some people are just going to pre prefer the real thing, even if they can't, you know, really tell the difference. I mean, I use ChatGPT every day. Uh, I do a bit of writing. I don't, I might use it to get ideas. Like I'll give me, give me 10 bullet points on something I can talk about. I, you've just shared my LinkedIn there and I would ask everyone to go follow me on LinkedIn because I do post, you know, re, uh, quite a lot and I try to post interesting stuff. Um, I think maybe one or two paragraphs of what I've written, I've copied and pasted from AI, but the rest of it is always me because my writing style is quite different and people would instantly know that it's not, but that's going to change. And I, I, what I, what I say is, you know, whether it's writing in ChatGPT or whether it's Google's music thing, it is only a matter of time until it gets just as good as or better of, as us. It's going to be indistinguishable. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's going to happen. There's no question about it. Elon Musk has said that, you know, AI is going to be better than humans at almost everything. If you look at AI, they used to go that it'll be great at the menial tasks and the repetitive stuff, but it's never going to be creative. Go ask AI to make, make a uh, poem or a sonnet in this in the style of Shakespeare about Bitcoin and the blockchain, and it'll do an amazing job. I asked it to create a Christmas song, you know, uh, for my son, and it did that. And, you know, I can't do that. There's yeah. no way in hell I can create a, you know, Shakespearean sonnet or a Jingle Bells about blockchain, but it did it in 10 seconds. Wow. And it's only going to continue. So not to sound like, you know, I'm having a, an existential crisis right now, but where does that leave us right, as of now? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, look, um, I'm unfortunately quite pessimistic about AI because I just don't think that our world and our governments are set up or able to deal with this systematic change that is mm -hmm. going to come so hard and so fast. Yeah. Um, Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, he's someone asked him a question going, what's the best case and what's the worst case? He goes, the worst case is lights out. That's it. There's something called the alignment problem. And the alignment problem is that when we build this AI that gets you know smarter than humankind combined, mm -hmm. Are its goals and its values going to be aligned with ours? And they may not be. And if they're not going to be, it will think humans are like ants and it will just sidestep us or crush us and go do whatever it wants. Essentially you know? terminate uh, just getting rid of Yeah. Maybe it'll go, well, listen, thanks for creating me. So I'll make things easier for you, but I'm going to go off and colonize the galaxy. That'd be awesome. Yeah. That's great. But because he also says that the upside is so good, it's unimaginable. Because mm -hmm. AI has the ability to create value beyond our wildest dreams, which could, you know, give us enough money to create a basic income for everyone in the world. So everyone has food, everyone has a, a roof over yeah. the table and work will become optional. That's what um, Elon Musk says. Elon Musk is building a robot now, like Boston Robot, Bo uh, Boston, Dynamics. Yeah, Boston Dynamics. Robotics. Thank you, Boston Dynamics. If you see their latest iteration of Atlas, the robot, it's got hands now, it's got claws yeah. and it can like do stuff on a building site. So it's going to be in factories, factory work is to be largely irrelevant. Yeah. It's going to be in offices, you know, it's going to be in the home. Maybe we'll have that robot from the Jetsons who will hoover and iron and stuff like that. But unfortunately, that's going to shed a lot of jobs. Because yeah. when you can buy a robot for $20,000 that works almost 24-7, and never complains and never has a day off, you know, I fear for, you know, the future of humanity. Now, I do also think that humans are incredibly adaptable and we will find yeah. ways to change this, but we also do need find ways to protect the most vulnerable in this. And unfortunately, governments, especially in the US, don't really think like that. I think our focus is going to, you know, shift towards spirituality as well. If was, if there's the worst case, you know, where we're losing our jobs, 
and where you know of course where one door closes another door opens as well and you will definitely work towards creating new opportunities and uh, new pathways to build uh, you know value for human life but yeah um so more i don't want to go too deep into this you know with respect to the philosophical side of things um I do want to understand the potential of AI and metaverse technology to address issues of music, uh, music copyrights and piracy. So is there, you know, what do you think yeah. you can add here? What well, I suppose one of the important things is that, you know, what is an NFT? An NFT is a method is, sorry, a method to put ownership and validity on a digital asset because a digital asset by nature is easily replicable. So the story I always do is this, if I'm an artist and I paint an oil, an oil painting and I sell that oil painting, well, you know, that's pretty straightforward. But what if I'm a digital artist and I make digital art? Well, I can send you my digital art that took me like 60 hours to build, um, but then you can just email it to your friend. Does he own that? Uh, no, he doesn't. So an NFT is the ability to put irrefirable proof of ownership on the blockchain of an easily replicable digital asset. Mm -hmm. And that is needed for music and NFTs. But there's also a, a guy I know who's working on something to show that, you know, you know, what if I create an NFT of an existing NFT on a different blockchain and then I can sell it? And that has happened. And people are creating you know, board apes or whatever it is, fake ones. And so we need a system and AI is the perfect way to do that is to constantly scan everything and make sure that everything is real and valid and not fake. When it comes to music, I mean, look, it's just, as we've already said, it will bring the ability to have the creator have control to get residual um, uh, uh, royalties of the transfer of ownership when things are sold on. And I think the main reason, the main use case for that is ticketing. So we talked earlier about the, you know, mess with, um, with, you know, Taylor Swift and uh, uh, who are the ticketing guys? i sorry, I can't remember. But, you, you know, with NFT tickets, it means that if their, their concert is really in demand and the, the tickets are resold, that some of that money comes back to the actual artists themselves. And I think mm -hmm. that's really good. Or we can do it in a way where, well, I want to go to this concert. So I buy an NFT and that NFT is a ticket and it's on my name. And if I can't go, well, then I'm really sorry, but you get your money back. You can't sell that on to your friend. But then what we'll do is whoever doesn't turn up on the day, maybe some extra people outside can get in and it'll stop scalping because yeah. this, you know, this, this way of scalping whereby people are buying tickets using bots on mass to simply resell them and make a profit is, is not fair to the fans and it's not fair to the artists. And that needs to change. And I think NFTs are a perfect way to do that. I also want to talk about dynamic NFTs for a second here, because you mentioned NFT tickets, right? How do you think a dynamic NFTs are going to play a role in developing the, the existing NFT technology and the use cases uh, around NFT tickets? Can you tell me a little bit more about what you mean by dynamic? Essentially, it, it's sort of it's sort of like you, you purchase an NFT, but the metadata keeps updating itself. The state of the metadata updates itself and sure. uh, it remains sort of you know dynamic. Where let's say if you have a, a property that you purchase as an NFT and uh, an unfurnished one, essentially in the uh, initially that you purchase one, then when you furnish it and you go and resell it, the NFT that you originally had all automatically updates his own state with respect to the metadata that you, you these are the number of editions you've had. Um, yeah. So on those lines, basically, well, I want to understand, you know, if you can think of any use cases for the music industry and the, the live event concerts. Well, I think the interesting thing here, like I said at the start, um, I believe that NFTs have a bad name right now yeah. because of million dollar monkey JPEGs, okay, uh, which people are just thinking that's insane and people are stupid and NFTs are idiotic, okay? But I think that's going to change very, very quickly. Like I said at the start, California have just said that they're bringing 
their DMV, the vehicle registration yeah. office onto the blockchain. Yeah. So your car will essentially be an NFT, or at least the registration for that car will be an NFT. And I've been talking about that for five years. You know, I mean, that's a perfect example. Let's say, for example, the service history of your car should be an NFT because it's it should be public and it shouldn't be, you know, shouldn't be on a piece of paper in your glove box that can get lost. You should have it her service history. Uh, property is another thing that is going to go on the blockchain. I have a friend. Um, he has a company in Canada. And what they do is they give normal people like you and me the ability to invest in a, uh, let's say, a, a block of apartments. And that block of apartments is going to appreciate wildly. But I don't I can't I can't afford five million dollars to buy a block of apartments or 20 million dollars. I also don't want to have to manage it. But they do that and they 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 manage the whole thing and they manage the capital appreciation and they manage your share of that within NFT. And I think mm -hmm. that can be dynamic. And I think that's really cool as well. Yeah. Um, I, I've been living in Dubai and the Dubai government are putting a lot of the governmental sectors on the blockchain because you know, why should we have to maintain a piece of paper that you can lose or can get burnt in a fire or stolen? These things should be on the blockchain and have shared control between you and the government. And I think that's really, really cool. Obviously, an awful lot of these things will need to be dynamically updated. But at the end of the day, I personally believe that the word NFT will fade out of the nomenclature yeah. because it's just Absolutely. not important that it's an NFT. It's just an asset that is digital, that has value and that needs ownership. Yeah. Completely I've agree. And I feel because I, I've got to go. Yeah, uh, I just didn't realize that we're over time. So yeah, I think we just we can stop here and we can just quickly address the questions that we have got from the audience. So sure. one is from Frederick, uh, who's asking, "What will be the price ratio a concert you attend uh, in person versus a concert you attend in the metaverse? Live concert concert prices are well, going up." Yeah, yeah, exactly. Look, our con I honestly I just want it to be as cheap as possible. If I can get it down to ten dollars, I'll I'll do that. It may be twenty dollars. I think thirty-five dollars is probably, you know, on the upper end. But then what we'll do is we will sell premium tickets for backstage pass, VIP tickets for meet and greets, things like that. But I definitely want to. I personally believe that if someone saw a ticket for a gig for whoever it is, Alicia Keys, Snoop Dogg, if it's $10, that's, that's, this, that's nothing. I'll do it. If it's 35, nah, you know, that, that starts to be a little bit more. I really want to keep them as low as possible to, to get a thing, but I'll tell you the other thing I want to do. I want people to be able to pay with two ways. They can pay with their money, but they can also pay with their time. And I think if someone is willing to pay with their time, that is very, very valuable. And I'll give you an example of that. Right now, oh, well, it's finished now, but we had a pre-sale going on, like a, a whitelist for our Snoop Dogg NFT drop. It's called a hardworking man NFT. If you'll see it on our website. I enabled people to get free NFTs by inviting their friends. And what happens is you get a customized URL and then if you can invite your friends and they sign up to this list, you get points. And the more points you get, the higher up the leaderboard you get. And at the top of the leaderboard, you get free NFTs. And some of those NFTs are worth $1,000. So if you're from the Philippines and you absolutely cannot afford $200 for one of these NFTs, but you can afford your time to go into all these groups and spread your little URL and get more points, then you can do that. And I want to be able to do that with NFT tickets as well for concerts. So you will be able to earn or win an NFT as well as buy, sorry, a ticket as well as buying it. And I, I think that's important. So I, I hope that answers your question, Frederick. Uh, so David Addison is asking if all these assertions are true, uh, could we reach a point where when the hum value of human capital is over and the mass subjugation of humans across the world what do you say to Americans who don't want to give shared control of personal assets to the government? Are we ushering in a future where decent yeah. is it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very difficult question and I could talk for ages yeah. on it. Americans it's sort of like social. a philosophical perspective. So yeah, I'm not a philosopher. Um, I just think that hopefully we can move towards a way where robotics and AI create so much value that we increase the 
you know, bottom end to the top of life and enjoyment, which means that everyone will have food on the table, a roof over their heads and some basic uh, things. And then, you know, look, a lot of us work really, really hard all the time to try and, you know, become financially free and make a lot of money. But a lot of us also got go, I wish I could just live on a desert island and have an incredibly simple life. And mm. maybe it, it will enable that, that if you want to work really hard, you can do that. And if you don't want to do that, we'll, we'll provide the basic means of, 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 of life for you. Um, I don't know how that's going to work across, you know, 285 governments. I really don't. Um, especially when the U.S. government just, you know, thinks socialism is the worst thing in the entire world. And because at the end of the day, and again, I could talk on this, there have been a lot of people from the boomer industry, sorry, from the boomer sort of uh, age group who they've grown up going, if you work hard, you can get enough money to get what to do what you want and you can do that. But working hard is really central to their very value of being. And they absolutely cannot stand other people just getting stuff for free. But at the end of the day, they're going to have to forget about that because when robotics and AI coming in and they're a taking so many jobs that people now can't work and there isn't enough jobs to provide for everyone and going to have to have some sort of universal basic income, we're going to have to find a solution for that. I'm not the world's greatest person to talk on this, to be honest with you, um, but I am fascinated on it. And I do think that, the you know, we need to figure out ways to do it. I watched a, a World Economic Forum presentation yesterday to talk about they already have technology to read our brainwaves now and you know they're going to be able to do wild things like that where you know uh, it, it will it will shed even more so i just i don't know where this is going um i just think we as a species need to think about solutions as to how we solve these problems so that they don't get ahead of us absolutely and if you want to see the dark side you can just watch an episode of dark mirror I think so. Exactly. Black well, the black that theory. explains it perfectly. It's, it's, it's happening. So thank yeah. you very much for having me, Nick. I'd really appreciate it, guys. Everyone follow me on LinkedIn. I do post really regularly on all of the stuff that I've been talking about today and more. I'm also starting a podcast. Uh, it's going to be kicking off in a couple of weeks, and it's called the Web3 Leaders Podcast. Uh, I'm going to have founders from Sandbox, Decentraland, OpenSea, Blocktopia, a whole load of other metaverses. Then I've got people from Google... Twitch, um, Coca-Cola, a whole load of companies all talking about Web3, the metaverse, NFTs, AI, robotics, everything we talked about here today. So uh, do follow me on LinkedIn and you'll see updates on that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Colin, for you know being here with, your, uh, with us today. I think it's Thanks been a again. fantastic session and I think we're going to keep having a lot more of these sessions and we do this every uh, Wednesday. And next Wednesday, we're going to cover all about gaming and metaverse and how um, it's changing the way we're uh, interacting with, you know, Web3 Gaming. So do tune in, guys. I think uh, it's going to be a wonderful session as well. So, yeah, thank you, Colin, for being Great. here. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening to um, Colin speak his mind. Cheers, Nick. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.